Good afternoon. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you so much uh, for joining us um, on this cold day where I am. Um, welcome to our guest, Ooh, Professor Anki Kroch, and uh, welcome to everybody who's here. I just want to thank uh, the uh, DVC for um, uh, uh, transformation and, and engagement, who Professor Andre Geert for uh, continuously just uh, uh, assisting us as a university community to reposition ourselves in terms of the academic project and really driving these knowledge, African knowledge seminars uh, alongside us. Um, uh, I just want to also acknowledge the, the team that does this work, uh, Jenny, Amy, Anele, and others. And uh, special thanks also to uh, the uh, Emengeni Institute uh, and Professor Okeja for working alongside us in, in really trying to think about knowledge. And also just thank Dr. Mutinda Nzioki of the Center for Philosophy in Africa for uh, uh, really trying to think outside of the box in terms of what should be done uh, in, in, in our universities as we rethink things. Now, um, today's seminar uh, should be quite uh, intriguing, just bringing together two texts of, South Af of the South African canon across time. Um, I'm really looking forward to Professor Kroch's um, uh, imaginative uh, conversation that she's putting between these two texts. Um, our uh, student um, host uh, today is Tiamo um, Nari, and she will do the introduction of the guest speaker uh, just now, and she'll also introduce herself. But let me just invite Ooh, Professor Kiet to welcome the guest today. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Nomalanga, and um, hello, Anki. It's uh, it's uh, great having you join us. Hello, friends and friends. A very warm welcome to all of you to our Africa and Knowledge Seminar Series, which was launched at the end of 2020. Today, we are honored to host Professor Anki Kroch. The series is a collaboration between the Center for Philosophy in Africa, the Faculty of Humanities and the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, all at Nelson Mandela University, as well as the Emangini Institute for Comparative Global Studies. It was born from the need to start thinking deeply and conceptually about Africa and knowledge, if we are as a university to truly become a dynamic Africa purpose institution. As the concept note so eloquently puts forward, since we are only able to know the world through the conceptual possibilities at our disposal in our specific spaces, the implication is that we must rely on those that shaped our imagination. What are these resources and how can we rethink them in light of the crucial task facing us on the continent today? This seminar series is a response to this challenge. The aim is to identify, critique, decouple, and remember the epistemic resources through which Africans have attempted to humanize the world and overcome the crisis of habitability on our continent, creating new forms of knowledges and re-readings that are capable of guiding action today is a key area of focus for the series. Prof. Scroch's topic turns us towards the resource of South African literature in order to reconsider what forms of knowledge and ways of thinking it offers to us by looking at possible new ways of reading Mhudi by Salty Plaiki and The Cry of Winnie Mandela by Njibulo Ndebele. These are both land, landmark novels within this African literary landscape by writers who have contributed in many profound ways as scholars, activists, creatives to African life and knowledge. We are looking forward to Prof. Kroch's re-exploration of these novels as we co-travel to think and read differently. Before we dig into this intellectual discussion, however, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the devastating loss of Prof. Bekezizwe Peterson, whose invigorating work Prof. Kroch draws from in the abstract for her talk. 
Once again, a warm welcome to you, Anki, and much thanks for sharing your insights with us today. And a hearty welcome and thanks to all of you who are joining us today for this discussion. Many thanks and enjoy. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Andre Giet, and um, indeed uh, the work of who Professor Peterson is, uh, has, we really stand on the shoulders of that in all kinds of disciplines in history. We draw on that work as we look at the uh, African historical literatures. Um, so we really, I want to acknowledge those people who really have tried to, to, to forge the, um, the path at a time when the path wasn't really understood within the South African Academy. I want to invite our student uh, co-host today, Utsiya Monare, to please introduce the guest speaker. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tia Monare, and I will be introducing our guest speaker for the day. Um, Anki Kroch is an Afrikaans poet, writer, and professor at the University of the Western Cape. She published 12 volumes of poetry in Afrikaans and three nonfiction books in English. She co-authored There Was This Goat in 2009 with two colleagues, Professor Gopano Ratili and Nosisi Golui, and published a book of essays as part of Siegel Books' African List, titled Conditional Tense, Memory and Vocabulary after the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Groch recently coordinated arguably the largest translation project of the literary works from indigenous languages into English. Under the auspice of the Center for Multilingualism and Diversity Research at UWC, funded by the NIHSS, the following were translated from Isikosa, Ikyala Lamawele, and Udo Jadu by S. E. K. Nkai, from Isizulu, Nomanini by W. Bilagazi and Asikondao Raviti by N.J. Ngadi. From Sisutu, Mosadi Angola by E.M. Kaketa, and the play Singatana by S.M. Mufugeng. From Sipedi, Nyoho Yabioko by O.K. Matsipe, as well as a poetry anthology with poems translated from all the major indigenous languages. These translations were published by Oxford University Press in 2019 under the title African calls. So I think we should welcome our speaker, Anki Kroch. Thanks so much, uh, Tiamu, uh, one of our honors students in philosophy. Welcome, Professor Kroch. The stage is yours. Okay. I want to say thank you to those who have invited me because it inspired me to bring together some of the texts that I had been working on for several years. Uh, and I also, of course, together with you, want to honor the late Professor Becky Siswe Peterson for the insight that changed the context of my reading of these texts. And I'm so pleased that the two of us could share an email uh, exchange, uh, a correspondence shortly before his uh, very untimely death. So the request was that I talk about the philosophical concept of interconnectedness within literature. I want to do it within the framework of Peterson's uh, recent essay. In it, he noted that Saul Pleike and his contemporaries, Thomas Mofolo and S.E.K. Mkai, were much more than poets and novelists. He said that they were inaugurating underappreciated method, a method or genre of creative meditation. And that's very important that these three writers created a method or genre, means some, something completely different than prose, poetry, a new genre of creative meditation. And that is, he says, creatively thinking through a range of difficult historical, political and social questions and challenges. So you use this meditation to think through things instead of philosophizing or theorizing in the conventional ways. Peterson's argument was that their texts challenged the orthodoxy of the novel in the 20th century. 
because they were structured in a way that allow a multiplicity of perspectives and arguments to emerge. This creative meditation made actual the thoughts of an African philosopher, social scientist and historian, but in a new configurated concept of what a novel should be. So it wasn't essays that was written, uh, philosophical essays. It was literary work that was used in, uh, in which these thinking through has happened. These writers brought together genres of writing that usually were kept apart in silos, he said, making their novels amongst other things, both philosophical and literary. So they mixed up uh, all the genres as part of this new uh, configuration. But now to read in this particular way does not sit comfortably with those who are not attuned to this specific genre or method. So if you're not aware of that, you don't read these texts comfortably. I'm going to present, present four examples of what happened when readers read particular literary texts without taking the underpinning of interconnectedness into consideration. During the Truth Commission, Mrs. Cynthia Ngeu, whose son, Christopher Pitt, was killed as part of the security police's murders of the Guguletu Seven, had the following to say when asked whether she supported the notion of forgiveness or reconciliation. And this is what she said. This thing called reconciliation. If I am understanding it correctly, if it means this perpetrator, this man who killed Christopher Pitt, if it means he becomes human again, this man, so that I, so that all of us get our humanity back, then I agree, then I support it all. So as a journalist covering the Truth Commission, I thought it was a remarkable statement, illuminating the complexity around reconciliation. When I published Country of My Skull, it was used as a headline quote at one of the chapters. But it was not until I made an in-depth study of African philosophy, interconnectedness and Ubuntu that I realized the profound philosophical depth of that sentence. It was suddenly as if lightning cracked open that sentence and clarified it as deeply profound and uh, ultimately core formulation, just as reflective as Descartes' famous sentence, I think therefore I am, or Mbiti's you are, therefore I am. So it's just as profoundly grasping the essence of a philosophy as those two sentences. Mrs. Ngeo's words mean firstly, that she understood that the killer of her child could and did kill because he has lost his humanity. He was no longer human. Secondly, she understood that to forgive him would open up the possibility for him to regain that lost humanity, to change profoundly. Thirdly, she understood that the loss of her son affected her own humanity. She herself had now an affected humanity. Fourthly, and most importantly, she understood that if indeed the perpetrator felt himself driven by her reconciliation to regain his humanity, then it would open up for her the possibility to become fully human again. It's truly an extraordinary formulation. The second example that I want to stop by is the novel Shaka by Thomas Mafolo. Shaka was written in Susutu and published in 1925. It was the first novel in an indigenous language in all of Africa. And it was named as one of the top five books written by an African 
in the 20th century. Shankar was translated into its current English version during the times when most academics irrefutably believed that black writers could not write what and how they wanted because the missionaries undue influence and their control of the printing presses of text in indigenous languages. So Professor Daniel Kunene, who translated Shaka from Susutu into English and wrote the foreword to it was in no doubt that the text was decisively influenced by Christian values. Kunene suggested that Christian values dominated the novel and that to please the missionaries, Thomas Mofolo deliberately portrayed Shaka as a totally depraved person, the originator of all things evil. Because the question was, why does a Basutu write about a Zulu king? So Kunenes uh, uh, agreed with a lot of critics at the time that he did that to show up the Zulu as particularly e evil uh, under the uh, auspices of Shaka. Professor David Atwell, many agreed with Kunene. Professor David Atwell agreed. He said Shaka constitutes a Christian, specifically mission oriented and Protestant intervention into the ideological domain of emergent black nationalist political life in South Africa. But during a seminar in Lesotho about the translation of Shaka and its original Sesotho, many things became clear, which showed that it was actually the translation and not the original text so much that brought in Christianity. And we had a whole discussion and we all wrote uh, several essays on the different uh, translations. But for example, the word evil, evil in terms of the opposite of evil within a Christian context. The word evil was brought in where the Sesotho text used a wider variety, more than one word, and much more nuanced words linked to disruption and disruption especially of, of humanity. So it, it seems as if the word evil was brought in, the, so the, the, the choice for a Christian slant was made more by the translator than actually by the original text. So let us focus on one specific moment in the book and we focus on several, but I just want to pick out one. The young and highly gifted Shaka was fleeing the unfair persecution and envy of his father's palace. So that's now the fictional story of Shaka. He fell asleep and when he awoke, he saw a powerful doctor, Isanusi, standing next to him saying, now tell me the desires of your heart and the one thing on which of all others you want me to concentrate my skills. So Shaka's first response in the novel was simple and modest. I do not have many wishes. My heart yearns for the kingship for which I was born, which slipped out of my hands simply because I've had bad luck. I say to you, work on me so that that kingship should be restored to me. In other words, Shaka wants a restoration, a bringing back of a harmony or balance. Harriet Ngobane in her work, Body and Mind in Zulu Medicine, confirmed the importance in Zulu culture of equilibrium and harmony. Uh, she says, good health means the harmonious working and coordination of the universe. The notion of balance is implied in the word lungisa with the verb lunga, which means to put in order, set as it should be, also meaning moral order and a symmetrical sense of relation with the universe. So we could say, Shaka wanted the kingship as a way to return to the equilibrium that was uh, destroyed. He wanted to return to a moral order of symmetrical sense. Who's the king? Who's he's under him? Who's the princess? 
and he wants this symmetrical sense of relation to be restored with his clan and his family. But now in the book follows the crucial moment. Slightly sarcastically, an incredulous Isanusi lured Shaka. I understand. All you want is your father's kingship. Beyond that, there's nothing that you want. Not even a kingship that surpasses that of your father. That is what you are saying. Is that not so? And so immediately, Shaka was made aware of far greater possibilities, amply laid out in front of him, and he let himself be seduced. Professor Kunene saw this as one of the moments in which Mufolo wanted to show Shaka as a sinner in the Christian sense. But in Christianity, there's nothing wrong with personal ambition. In fact, individualism and personal striving had become the essence of Christianity. But within African philosophy, that is when Shaka has taken his most fatal step. Professor Gabriel Setluane in his unpublished manuscript, How the Traditional Worldview Persists in the Christianity of the Sututswana, formulated what he regards as the African concept of sin. So in African philosophy, the concept of sin is to live in careless disregard of others. And this was what was wrong in Shaka's choice, a choice to disregard others, wanting more than restoring balance. No, he said to Isanusi, I do want that. If you can make me into a great king, I shall be very grateful. And true enough, Isanusi's first instructions were as follows. Hut, if you like kingship and fame, you must be like this. Where necessary, you must reduce everything to total annihilation. You must sweep it all away. Your second lesson is you must part with mercy from this very day because mercy destroys the owner. In the novel, the effect of this deliberate disregard has an immediate dehumanizing effect on Shaka. And I'm quoting, the day Shaka left home in flight, that day he, when he left, when he flew, he left as Shaka, a human being like all other human beings who had human failings. Today, writes Mavolo, he comes back greatly changed. It is only his flesh that is coming back. Only his outer self. As for his true self, that has remained at that place from which he is returning. He comes back with a completely different spirit and a different personality. Indeed, Shaka returns with no human feeling left in him his sole aim being to kill. The frightening vengeance in his heart is indeed about to drive him mad. So one can see that the whole plot is actually not in obeisance with Christianity. But it is the opposite. It is in obeisance with the notion of interconnectedness, interconnectedness within a position of leadership. And of course, in the book, Shaka's end was terrible. So let us admire and revel in Mufolo's exquisite description of a dehumanized man, a man who has not only killed thousands of people, including his wife, but had in his fictional final days forced Zulu to turn against Zulu, Zulu to kill Zulu. And you can see Mufolo wants to say that is you know, that is, that is the pits of sin, is to make uh, Zulu kill Zulu. So now we can read uh, example two. He awoke sweating and shuddering in the night. That's now shortly before uh, Dengan came to kill him. 
a, a jackal cried in pursuit of him. A hyena screamed, penetrating his heart. A dog howled, accusing him of killing its owners. He walked agitatedly up and down, water boiling furiously in his stomach. His eyes sank deep in their sockets, receding far to the back. And sometimes they bulged out and drooped like those of a drunkard whose lungs had been consumed by liquor. He resembled a horse suffering from intestinal fever, running and biting itself, tearing the flesh from its body with its own teeth. His soul was in unbearable pain. The pain woke him up. Then he tried to stand up, but was unable to do so. He tried to scream, but his mouth was stilled. Something pressed him to the ground. Finally, he heaved himself up and reached for his spear. He stood on his feet and threw glances this way and that. But he found that there was perfect stillness. It's such a, a fantastic book. It's such a fantastic book. And then Kunene's translation. One can have problems here and there, but it's a marvelous translation. Okay, but the same uh, the same issue is at play in Saul Pleike's book Moody, and that's also a first. It was the first novel written by a black person in English in South Africa. Uh, several reviewers and scholars, including those who re-edited and reworked the original text, found arguments for or against the novel's harboring of what is described as an incongruous mix. So there were things in this, books that, in this book that doesn't make sense, that doesn't link up. Uh, so in order to protect Plyke uh, as a misguided uh, effort to protect Plyke from the largely negative reception of the book, two academics wrote a piece in what they suggested that there was undue missionary pressure on Plyke. And that's why you, you can't really judge the book because the missionaries interfered too much, which was the same that was said from uh, about Shaka's book. However, Professor Brian Willen, who wrote the biography of Plyke, re-established Plyke's agency and authority on the text through his impeccable research. And he interpreted that article that tried to remove Plyke's agency from the text as follows. In a way, what they wanted to do was to establish an alibi for Plyke so that when criticisms were made of Mahudi, whether of style or substance during the largely unsympathetic and patronizing critical reception that Mahudi encountered during the high apartheid regime of the 1970s, the argument could always be made that the true original text had been distorted and that Plyke could not be held responsible for something over which he did not exercise control. Following Professor Peterson's advice about a new way of reading, one can say that the very need to find an alibi for Plyke sprouted from a refusal to engage with the interconnectedness as a deliberate and undeniable subtext. So you, you like me, when, when I read Mrs. Singeo's, you know that, yeah, you know that this is very good, but it's only when you do the a specific kind of reading where the whole depth of that book is unlocked. So let us look at the opening page for those raised on the Western 20th century model. The first paragraph was already very, very uncomfortable to read because Plyke sketched the first, the first paragraph is a geographical space, but he's, he writes it as if traveling in a quiet, high up drone over the landscape. Everything was seen, everything named, nothing divided, nothing separated. The era, area between central Transvaal and the Kalahari Desert saw people 
living in large communities, sowing, harvesting, melting iron, hunting, raising families, squabbling and breeding cattle. Without money, says Blighty, and without watches. Without orphans, without obvious wealth or poverty. Then suddenly the text mentioned the peasants on the plantations in Virginia and Mississippi. And then back to the Hottentots and Boers in the Cape. Now one would immediately question the use of watches. There wasn't watches there. The plantations in Virginia and Mississippi and the Hottentots, because the rest of the novel never returned to them. And that's one of the fundamental uh, rules when you write in a Western context is don't bring things into your literary text that you don't mean to follow up or follow through. So what are these things doing there? But the question became irrelevant when one accepted that it was the author's explicit desire to establish a context of universal and cosmic interconnectedness that should remain in the back of your mind if you read this book. He didn't need to return to it ever in the text. He simply wanted to introduce the reader to this wide universe. So it's not like, here's the book and I'm not going, it's here's life and I'm going to tell you a story, but you must remember this life. Eh? Like he worked with a wholeness of life and therefore actually much more than Umuntu Nguntu Ngabantu because Plaiki put the complete web in its full totality, as well as its, its contradictions in the narrative right from the start. So although the novel was ultimately also, like in Shaka's sense, about the disrupting and destroying of interconnectedness in a particular corner of the world at a particular time, the author deliberately placed it in a context of the indivisibility of the world in its widest, and holist sense. So onto these interwoven communities of mankind, birds, trees, insects, porcupine holes, stars, disruption descended, he said. Fling Shaka, Mzirikazi, ruling by the sword, moved with the Matabele along the banks of the Far River, asserting his bloody domain and extorting tax from those he had conquered. Immediately, the author spelled out the way the Matabele were overstepping the accepted practices of being linked in wartime. Instead of taking Barolong women and children into the conquering community, the Matabele chose to kill them. So this disruption of the Matabele affected the whole web of life of the Barolong, including the cattle. And this peculiar paragraph elicited much irritating frowning, example three. People were very irritated by what is now written in this paragraph. Oxen bellowed and cows lowed, for they all failed to recognize the cowmen. The calves had been separated from their mothers early that day and the latter were now being milked. Hundreds of calves remonstrated loudly against this wholesale theft of their mother's milk. They seemed to ask what their elders had their big horns for. If hornless people could with impunity practice such systematic robbery at their expense. Hundreds of cows seemed to low some explanation in reply. What it was, they alone knew. But the bulls and bullocks, on the other hand, held down their heads in very shame, as if lamenting their impotence. So this was not the kind of paragraph that you would find in, a, in Western literature. If they write about animals, you know it's because it's human beings. It's hares and they pretend they are human beings. It's dogs, but they are actually human beings. But this author dived into the very souls of cattle, how displaced they felt, 
how contemptuous about the cowardliness of those with horns. But I mean, cattle with souls and emotions like shame, you know, only possible in a novel when the underpinning is interconnectedness and you know you have knowledge of the intimate uh, relationship between the Barolo, the Botswana and cattle and in, in, in general with Africans and cattle. But there was an even stronger indication for me of interconnectedness and that was loneliness. After witnessing terrible killings by the Matabele, the word loneliness and the effects of loneliness suddenly entered the text as a persistent kind of chant. Fleeing, the hero acknowledged that the loneliness was frightful. He searched for the company of human beings. The more he searched, the more his feet dragged, his spirit drooped, his solitude filled him with gloom. This loneliness filled him with gloom. And after Mahudi herself came onto the scene, the frequency of the concept of loneliness intensified. You would thought that, but it intensified actually. As she describes that the loneliness was overwhelming. The hideous silence accentuated our loneliness. The word alone, lonely, yearning to meet other human beings. We are haunted by the fear of our loneliness. It was, it's strange because loneliness is such a integral uh, thing of every person, I thought. I first encountered the idea that loneliness was the opposite of interconnectedness and arguably even un-African in a discussion among poets from Africa on a journey to Timbuktu. Amina Zaid, originally a Tunisian, but uh, lived in Paris for many years by then, she read some of her poems. And after she read them, the Zimbabwean poet Chenjerai Hove said to her, your poems are a lot about loneliness. And she said, isn't it the essential human condition? Not the essential African human condition, Chenjerai Hove said, I'm never lonely. I'm always surrounded by forefathers, by nature, by cloud, by stars. So I would suggest that loneliness was introduced by Plaiki to outline the tragedy of the couple. Their connectedness with others had been brutally cut, leaving them in aloneness. When they found each other amidst their happiness, they were without family support and therefore potentially alienated. And although Plaiki uh, presented other forms of interconnectedness, such as the blessing of rain, the forest is their home, the rustling trees are their relations, he knew, he wanted to say they needed a community to build their personhood and fulfill the potential of their relationship. So slowly the author lead them to link up in the text with survivors of the Barolong and also later with the Boers. A complete universe was present in Muhudi and the oxygen of Plaiki's imagination set hours free in the transformatory spaces that only art at its best could create. And the wonderful, wonderful thing for me in the text is the meeting of the Barolo with the Boers tracking past. I, 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 I find that ast astonishing. Every time I read it, I get goosebumps because of what he is attempted in doing it, but it's too long. It's a separate lecture. Okay. The cry of Winnie Mandela has met with a lot of dismissive comments at its publication and is only now being recognized as probably the most important novel to have come out of South Africa's new dispensation. There were several reasons why I was keen to read Njabulu and Debele's take on Winnie Mandela. Firstly, it was dangerous to write about her. Many people, including Nelson Mandela, had their reputations battered by thinking that they know her or understand her 
and therefore could in some way influence or control or interpret her narrative. It was never easy to be against Winnie, but it was even more difficult to be on her side. So imagine my complete surprise when right on the very first page, before one could think of Winnie, the chapter heading read, Penelope's descendants. Excuse me? Black woman? A Greek mythology, myth, myth, a Greek myth's descendants? Stumbling across Penelope right at the beginning, two things struck me. The one was the question posed by philosopher Paul C. Taylor from Temple University at a seminar at UWC, and I will never forget that. He was saying, what the hell is white folk always doing in black folk stories? The other question was, why didn't Ndebele look far and wide to find an African female ancestor for Winnie, instead of framing her in terms of the most classic foundation of Western civilization's notion of perfect womanhood. I mean, wasn't that the big problem that Winnie had been and still is being judged from a Western perspective? Besides, I, and I'm sure most of you, knew more about Winnie than about Penelope. So why this inclusive gesture? My second surprise was that Winnie was clearly not the main narrator of the story, nor was she the main character or protagonist. Neither was Penelope the antagonist or the opposing force. For nearly half the book, four women told their own stories or asked Winnie questions without a real linear structure. There was no proper beginning to the novel, nor was, uh, nor was there a logical end, only a metaphysical end. The value system of Kossa society, said Harold Scheub in his foreword to A.C. Jordan's Tales from Southern Africa. This value system cannot be worked out on the basis of a single performance. The value system must be discovered through an analysis of an entire tradition. Now to transplant this onto Ndebele's text, Winnie's story had no meaning on its own. One could gather nothing from it, no matter how powerful and fascinating she as an individual was. By his choice of format, Ndebele was saying, to focus obsessively on Winnie as an individual was to completely miss the point. The story about Winnie was the story about every one of us and was at heart an ethical story. And Winnie confirms that. Winnie says, all of you, all of you, the, all of you have to reconcile not with me, but with the meaning of me. For my meaning is the endless human search for the right thing to do. And by not making Winnie the main character in the traditional way, and by using about half the book to establish a group of ordinary women and the men who harmed them to form the community from which Winnie came, the order was saying very firmly, she was us. She was whom she was through us. We made her and she made us. And that we included not only the woman, but Nelson Mandela, her torturer, Major Swanepoel, and her regarded prototype, Penelope. If the black woman were because Winnie was, then so was Penelope because Winnie was. Penelope is therefore nothing without Winnie as her shape maker. This effectively meant that white people were not only linked to Winnie through the cruelty of Major Swanepoel, but also through the equally cruel presence of Penelope. And we would be like Penelope, Penelope, nothing without Winnie and the black woman in the text. Nibele was clear. We all had to reconcile with Winnie. 
Winnie herself, however, needed not. So unlike Mrs. Ngeo, she needed not. Winnie says at one place, for me, reconciliation demands my annihilation. Because a reconciling Winnie is no longer Winnie. It is precisely her cruelty and falseness. She says, I am all of you who maim and rape that we all have to think and to care about. Winnie said, the journey to your future goes through the dot of loving me. So there's several dots in one's journey. But if you want a future, you need the dot of loving me despite myself on the world map that lays our journeys towards all kinds of human fulfillment. So if as a human being and being humane, you want to find fulfillment, you have to travel through that dot of an unreconciled Winnie. But he goes further. I, it's an uh, astonishing novel, this. Put on the road by an African writer who rewrote Penelope's badge of honor from faithfulness to reconciliation. Penelope finally changed and a black writer spoke through her. And I'm not sure if we grasp the sheer cheek in a way, the chutzpah of this to decide I'm going to take this mythical woman and I'm going to speak through her. I'm going to give her an interior, a new interior and new thoughts. I, I am going from Africa. I'm going to give it to her. I need example four. So now Penelope speaks. My journey follows the path of the unfolding spirit of the world as its consciousness increases and deepens. So that actually says, you know, the world was small in the Grecian times, but as the, for un, as the spirit unfolds and consciousness becomes deeper, as the world learns to become more and more aware of me, not as Odysseus moral ornament on the mantelpiece, but as an essential ingredient in the definition of human freedom. So you find Penelope as an essential ingredient towards human freedom in the same way that you have to travel through the dot of the unreconciled uh, wing. Instead of Africa being dictated to by a Western framework, Ndebele, Ndebele brilliantly used Winnie to create an alternative root and African framework for Penelope. And through the force of the stories of these black women, Penelope changed from someone that was perhaps faithful out of passivity into somebody who now travels the road, trying to bring about active change towards freedom through reconciliation. There's that wonderful moment where Winnie in the combi and the other woman in the combi and with lots of food and they were traveling and laughing and talking important things and suddenly here's this um, hitchhiker and Winnie says, yes, stop, stop. And they turn down and here is Penelope. Penelope wants a ride. It's, this is marvelous, this is fantastic. They said, no, get in, get in. And th there is this other uh, conversation happening there. Uh, in other words, because we are all interconnected, none of us can be without Winnie, without Sarah Bartman, uh, who is on the cover of the book, without Penelope or without ourselves. And to be our fullest self and to have our giftedness, that's uh, Jabulu's word, giftedness released, we have to accept each other as part of ourselves. On page 76, Marara 
Joyce Baloy and example five, Marara Joyce Baloy, she, she says, come Winnie, my arms are wide open, come into my arms, waiting for you to save me with the open drama of your life. My arms are all I can give you, together with questions, wonderings without judgment. Come into my arms and give me to myself. Come into my arms and stir me back into feelings. What a wonderful request that you can only begin to feel when you recognize the fullness and the necessity to embrace also the wrong. So, oh, in conclusion, in the first example by Mrs. Ngeu, one can see how a quote can be read and not nearly fully understood. But when read with knowledge of the underpinning worldview, its profound depths are revealed. The next two texts, Shaka and Moody, by two contemporaries, show how they both deliberately chose a time predating full-on Christianity, in the early 1800s, to interrogate the ethical concept of interconnectedness in leadership and in friendship. But because of deep failings within the 20th century literary construction, there was simply no appropriate space for Shaka and Muhudi. So they were in a, in a sense rendered defenseless against suggestions that they were baby steps of writers trying to move from an oral tradition to the literary. So people could never fully praise them, fully celebrate them because it was this discomfort among Western readers about it. A major astonishing jump was made by Ndebele's text. He read Mofolo Shaka text already as a student at the University of Roma in Lesotho. And in an interview I had with him, he acknowledged how the novel made him aware how one could use a well-known but complex figure as a vehicle within a fictionalized context to ask ethical questions as he did with Winnie. And it's so strange, hey? So to do that, to use some that everyone know, everyone knows this, this is Shaka and this is Winnie, and you bring them in a fictionalized, has not happened because suddenly now in Afrikaans, we, we hear that the term autobiographical fiction. So a lot of it is true, but it's in a fictional context. Okay? So it's the first time that I hear this phrase now being mentioned that was already done in, in Shaka. Uh, Ndebele jumps from a pre-Christian man, Shaka, to a contemporary woman. He embeds her not only among other similarly affected women, but he embeds her also in a mythological woman as well. But unlike his two predecessors, he does not interrogate interconnectedness. He was not trying to, to analyze it in terms of a novel. He assumes it as a given, as a powerful philosophy and any time as ancient and influential as that of the Greeks. In fact, it is so powerful that it could make space for Penelope, not as an add-on, but with an inclusiveness that could free her from the terrible indictment Western civilization placed on her. These texts all profoundly challenged the orthodoxy of the novel in the 20th and even now in the 21st century. They blasted the traditional format of the Western literary novel open by creatively thinking through the ethical foundations of their communities and how to portray that as part of a specific ontology. That is the, the undercurrent of all three of these novels. It's a different ontology. They radically changed this genre of the novel 
and is still forcing us to acquire new ways of reading in order to grasp the full richness of these marvelous texts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Groch. Um, I just, uh, I'm thinking I need to see your, that translation of Don Jadu and uh, here in public, I'm going to ask you to, to get into that one because this, um, those texts when read, not in the, that gaze that you are critiquing, you can see just how out of the box these writers are. Um, so I have, a, I have a particular investment in continuing this conversation with you with Mkhaiz Don Chatu because it's, 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 your framework is just phenomenal. So I need that translation. Is it is it available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, you can. It's uh, uh, but it's in the bookshops. But that book that shop. specific book is is yeah. extremely difficult to find. But it's it's a crucial example of what you are talking about. Yeah, yeah. of what you are talking about. No, I me and you we can live in this world <laughs> of these novels. Um, I just wanted to to ask a question. My network is quite bad, so Jenny will will help me. I know that you've delivered quite a rich and sophisticated and, and, very, um, and very nuanced take on these historical literatures. And uh, I, I'm sure it's intimidating for some people to get into them. I see a, a hand from Professor Kiet. I'll let him ask his question and then I want to put a question forward. Professor Andre? Yes. I see your um... hand, yeah. Yes, I will be. I just want to switch this over to this side so I can look straight into the camera. Thank you. That was amazing. Eh? Thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, it held uh, the both the thought processes and the thinking processes and the, you know the emotional effective engagement. You know, very very well. And much thanks for putting in the energy. You know, into this analysis. But I want to I want to focus on genre. Uh, you know, um, and I, I'm trying to figure out, uh, and I've always posed this question into the humanities and the social sciences, whether literary studies, especially in the mold of, uh, you know, uh, Plaiki and Nivelle uh, and the two examples that you've used, whether it um, presents a more productive view of engaging with social reality than say, for instance, uh, our schemes that we use in sociology or philosophy. Because if that, if that, is, a, if that is a new, what would you say, um, uh, creative meditation that uh, Peterson you know, ascribed to these uh, novels, um, actually challenging you know, the established genre uh, as you know, the kind of uh, conventional ways in which we engage with the world around us. Would you would would you would you think that we that as you, as universities and academic institutions we give sufficient attention to that? You know what? Um, it's such an important question, and I think it should be debated uh, everywhere because we raise, we teach, we deliver to the world students that are in many ways barbarians because they haven't read a single book and, and, and a, a specifically a novel. The thing about reading a novel or reading a poem is it, it makes of you somebody else. When I read this, uh, uh, Shaka, I, it makes me there. And that makes me a more nuanced person as someone who has never been someone else except him or herself. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very important uh, uh, character forming thing to read literature because it, 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 it catches your heart. It moves you move and it changes your, your uh, view. I always say, what I know in life, I've learned from poems. I've learned how to love from poems. I learned how to grieve from poems. I learned how to look from poems. Uh, 
so you can see broader, you see more, you experience more lives. And when I started at UWC, they asked me at the development department, there was a course that you could do um, local development. And they asked me to put together a literary course for students to read and, and analyze as while they study all the theories on, on, on development. Because they were saying at the end, the students say, you, le you learn all these theories, but when you read the books, you know, for example, um, uh, God's Bits of Wood, where the railway line was built, what the effect that development has, the destruction, the changes, the thrills, etc. So that the books gave the life to them while the academia gave the theories and you can't have the one without the other. So I, you know, I'm just going to give another example. There's apparently a, co uh, a group, an uh, international group. They identify across the world, young, talented CEOs, possible CEOs, you know, that's going to be very powerful within five or 10 years. They take them away for a week, a year, and they give them literature. And they, they, the first thing they have to do is to perform Antigone. They have to make the characters, they have to do the, cons, uh, the costumes, someone has to do the lighting, they have to do the production, the advertisement, etc. To learn them, to, to change them from economic barbarians into human beings. So I, yeah, I, I cannot, I think it's crucial. I think it's crucial. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for that, Anki. I've actually done that Antigone with those people, uh, Anki. <laughs> it's very <laughs> interesting, yeah. <laughs> All these adults are putting on a great play. No, fantastic. I just wanted to ask you, uh, I see a question here by Prof. Okeja. Um, I just wanted to ask you, is this method about rethinking the way in which the, South, the novel in South Africa, let me not say the South African novel, I <laughs> know, <laughs> I won't get into that trap, but the way the novel in South Africa is, is to be understood. I'm reminded of Lauren Bukes, who uh, I've never read the book because I don't read that genre, but I'm reminded when years ago, she couldn't set a story in South Africa because she couldn't unthink the South African environment for time traveling serial killers. So Lauren Bukes couldn't write her book in South Africa, uh, set, in, set the book in South Africa, the story, because the South African world was too totalitarian for her. And what I'm sensing though, is that maybe what Lauren Bukes needed to read was so like you or begin to unpack the South African uh, matrix through a much different, let's go through that point that you were talking about, you know, you, to get, you know, you get through that point when you're talking about uh, the cry of Winnie Mandela and go through that thing so that you could actually begin to think of a, a novel set in South Africa in which you can have a time traveling serial killer and the past book is not <laughs> an issue or, you know, the apartheid police don't get in the way of reimagining that society. Um, I just wonder if if you could comment on that because I just think, mm, yeah, I, the black, I, yeah, no, it's a it's a, a, a important observation because uh, at this stage, yo, but let me be careful because this is uh, recorded. Um, there's so many good black writing, black writers writing that many white writers shift to crime. Not all, but they shift to crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering why. And, and one of the reasons is that you can create an, another community without race there. They have different names, they have black names, whatever, but here they are uh, and there's no, there's no past in each of them. Yeah. Which, which we all want. I mean, the whole TV is full of soapies where there's no race, you know, so everyone is just fine there. Uh, so 
I'm wondering what would happen if you do this, if you take this concept, this interconnectedness, and you take it to the crime story. You know, what, 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 what will open up there? Uh, and it's a pity that this, that nice story of that woman detective in uh, Zimbabwe, um, I forgot now her name, but that- Botswana, that, that, the, the Botswana, Botswana, that's right, uh, Botswana. Yeah, Botswana, mm, yeah, now, yeah. That I wondered what, what an, uh, a black writer embedded in, because of, of course not, not everyone is, is writing that, but uh, what he would make of that. Uh, yeah. The, the biggest problem is that the reviewers, those who review the books, are not necessarily those who are always willing to read in a new, new way. Yeah, I think Andrea's question, the way you answered it is important about literature, but uh, just before I go to Prof. Foketa's question, there is a question though about whether literature, literary studies is still the domain of the imaginative. I mean, a lot of us are very tired of the wokeness and the self-indulgent sort of uh, over-textualized analysis of society. I'm not sure if literature, the way it's uh, uh, conducted today, uh, responds to the material questions that Andre is talking about. I mean, what do you think about that? I don't know if you are particularly interested in this um, framing of political correctness as wokeness, but uh, I just was struck by your response and I wondered, I wouldn't suggest anybody do a literature today in the way it's done because it teaches such a lot of self-indulgence. That's just me. <laughs> Should I just move to the next question? <laughs> That's too much. <laughs> okay, I'll read the next question. Uh, Professor Uchana Okeja uh, asks the question, I just wanted to ask about the example you gave about the formulation of sin in African philosophy. In this context, sin is constructed as the, as the act of living in a way that totally ignores the humanity of others. This is fascinating because it invokes the notion of Ubuntu as a normative resource that could help us to rehumanize the world. My concern is with the impossibility of sin in the contemporary world was shaped by an economic imagination that says the only way to survive, to be human, is to pursue self-interest. In other words, to be perfect homo economicus, does this lack of an option to live without sin as constructed in, your exam in the example you invoked mean that sin is now a mode of being? If yes, what becomes of the aspiration to be human? You can just read that to the side um, if you wish. This, oh, let me let me just start earlier. I was in Germany for a time and there were some philosophers with me and some of them were doing Kant, others were doing Plato and they were sort of the top, 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 top professors in the world, but they were busy with Kant and with Plato. And I was, I was thinking how Western philosophy is built up and then all the time people start from the beginning and make it stronger and start from the beginning and make it stronger. And you begin again with Plato and, and take it further. So how that philosophy is strengthened and strengthened and strengthened. Well, African philosophy is, there's so much still to be uh, unpacked in a way. The one is sin. Uh, the, the, and that is one of the big issues around the Truth Commission. Uh, and there's people who regard uh, a phrase of uh, Cynthia Ngewe as, as utterly problematic because, and Mahmoud Mondane has talked about the embrace of evil. Why is South Africa embracing evil? There's other academics that says it's because of the embrace of evil that we are now in this corruption and mess that we are in. So let, let go of interconnectedness. It's, the, it's, it's our downfall. So, and, and also the, so sin is, the, and, and what does it mean? Does it mean if I kill a beggar that doesn't, 
disturb or disrupt the, the balance, is it okay then? So I must just not kill someone that disrupt the, the balance. Then also the whole thing of feminism, the whole thing about women, in, in what way is, so this, I don't know how to, it's, and it shouldn't also be, it should be the philosophers dealing with that, uh, but keep on dealing with that and not be distracted because I remember also there in Germany, the people who followed uh, Arabic philosophy, they would then begin with Arabic philosophy. And then after 10 minutes in their speech, then they start talking about Hegel. Then there they go with Kant. And you can see they want their Arabic philosophy to link, uh, or Islam philosophy to link to Western philosophy. And that distracts you. I had a student who wanted to, uh, a student who wanted to write about uh, it in literature, about interconnectedness in literature. And one of the reviewers said, yeah, but you know, what about Hegel? What about it? And I said, just leave this person that he can write about what he understands. Forget about always trying to, to link to that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not, last thing I want to say is that that book of um, Professor Setluani has never been published. There's so much in it, and that's also a, a disgrace. So there's texts around interconnectedness. And I would say that in studying African philosophy, these books of Njabulu and Debele, et cetera, should be part of the texts. And that I see now suddenly the Western philosophers are studying John Kutsia's text, text, because they say he is ahead. He is the biggest philosopher at this stage in Western philosophy. He is breaking new ground and philosophers need to follow him. So, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if, uh, Prof. Ketcher, you want to respond or we can move on? Step down. Thank you, okay. I just want to uh, read out Dr. Makokwana's question. Maybe I should invite you to put the question to to pro or make the comment yourself, uh, Dr. Babalwa. Okay, I'm gonna read it out. This beautiful reading of the text by Anki just confirms the depth of language and how it influences ontologies that free us. Thank you so much as always, Anki. I have enjoyed the idea of mutual obligation that runs through the texts. Um, I'm not sure if you have an ongoing conversation there with Baba Loma Kukwana about these ontologies. Um, you spoke about the texts um, uh, sort of drawing on a, a different kind of ontology in the 20th century. Um, maybe you can just talk a bit about that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm interested in that, but um, uh, I see you, Professor Kiyadar. I'm also interested in your comment on the depiction of the the Trekpurs, uh passing by Barolong and why that particularly moves you. Um, perhaps you can just comment on that. I know you want a whole seminar on it, but just touch on that in the, in relation to what you've been talking about interconnectedness. And then we'll move to Professor Kiyadar. Uh Let me just uh, quickly uh, talk about the ontologies. It, it feels... Uh, 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 I became aware of the ontologies during the South African Truth Commission. Uh, and it was also has to do with Christianity. Um, and sorry, those who have heard the story, but uh, I was interviewed uh, during the Truth Commission process as a journalist by an Israeli filmmaker. And the Israeli filmmaker, oh, he said, this, what an incredible process is happening here. And he can't believe it, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, but will it work in Israel? And he said, no, 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 no. You know, you, you are Christian. That's, it's working here because it's Christian. It will never work. It will never work in, in Palestine. No, no, no. OK, sorry. Oh, I, stupid me. Uh, then I was interviewed by an Irish uh, journalist 
who also moved to tears about the process, thinks it's wonderful. I said, will it work in Ireland? No, there's too many Protestants. You need to be a Catholic. Forgiveness is based on Catholicism. Catholic, okay. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, of course, because all the truth missions was in South America and it's all Catholics. So then someone interviewed me from Australia and she said, yeah, no, it's not Christian. It's nothing of that. It's you white people who are conning black people. Uh, and it's even worse than apartheid, what you are doing now. And I was, I, I, I thought 45 million people with the likes of Archbishop Tutu and President Nelson Mandela, you are now insulting them that they are too stupid to see they are being manipulated by white people. But, but I began to question this idea that Christianity, that we are using Christianity to do this whole thing. And I went to the testimonies that were given in the first week of the Truth Commission hearing. And not a single black person said, I will reconcile or I will forgive because Jesus has forgiven me. It's only white people who have said that. And there were some colored people who were at the St. James massacre. So it, it, I suddenly became aware of this two ways of thinking that the one is thinking, I will forgive because Jesus, and then I will go to heaven. And this is my ontology. My, but you have another group that says, I'm connected. I'm connected to you. You, you have to change. You have to change. And that I forgive you so that you can change. But we have never understood that part, that the change part, the, to, become, to become humane. We have it is as if we have never understood that because there is Jesus. You know, we asked um, one of the generals, Archbishop Tutu said, um, you know, that uh, you must ask forgiveness. Uh, and he said, I will ask forgiveness of God. So I interviewed Tutu. I said, General Grunewald says, he will only ask forgiveness to God. And Tutu says, yes, that's right. But if he beats his wife, he has also to ask forgiveness of her. So I become just aware of this clash. Um, the, the, the meeting of, of the Barolong and the Boers, this story develops. It's the, the hero and the heroine, and here they are, and they have a community again, and they have a chotla, and there's a case, and suddenly they hear a noise outside and of horses. And there's a commotion and in comes a white man. And he says, uh, good afternoon. I am Sarl Salia. Now I grew up in Kronstadt where there's a huge statue of Sarl Salia, you know, saying God will help us at Blutrefi. He is a holy man for Afrikaners. Here he comes in. It's, he comes into a black community as an ordinary man, not as a saint, not as a evil devil, but as an ordinary man. He says, please, can you help me? Our cattle has been uh, taken and we need help. Can you? And the, and the ordinary way. So, Part of me says, don't, don't do that. We are terrible people. Keep on portraying us as terrible people. And then I think, no, like in Jaburu, Plaiki is teaching me a lesson of allowing his imagination to imagine white people capable of being humane beings. And so they, in the book, he has a friendship developing between the man and the, and the Africana, the young Africana. And that, and of course it doesn't work out, but that possibility that we could be friends, that we could 
have a normal relationship. It's so unbelievable that so many years back, Ply, he could have that fearlessness, that cheek, I, I want that sort of guts to imagine a friendship. And I mean, that's, that's what he, these texts do. And I do think if you want to talk about woke, that is to allow the imagination of the literary text, allow it to take you somewhere where you haven't been, allow it. You can always come back, but allow it. Thanks. Yeah, that is that's quite interesting. You, I'm immediately triggered with Arar Ar Lomos Dingane and the depiction of Herod Maritz and Pidratif now. And again, it goes back to the need to study the canon in conversation. I'd never thought of it like that, because in that novel Dingane, there's an ambivalent portrayal of those Trekburs as they enter into Dingane's territory. They're pretty much his servants. <laughs> <laughs> in some way. Uh, so I just want to invite, there is a question here and then I'll invite uh, Professor Kiet to ask the last question. There's a question here, I can't see the full name, Fonobong, can't see the full name. It says, sorry, Prof, I seem not to, to have understood your answer to Professor Okeja's question. Does it mean we must now give up on becoming human, especially we from the context where survivalist imagination is supreme. So that goes back to the first question, which is in our current environment, where economy is supreme and we have no sense of what the, the concept of humanity is and the way that you are talking about it. Um, the question that, is coming from that. And that's what makes uh, Njabulu's book important because he is doing is dealing with it now but not now, now, it's, it's, it's still uh, uh, the Truth Commission time. It just, I despair when I look at the economics and I despair at the, at the disappearance of a moral conversation, either through um, by politicians, by ordinary people, and, and also at times in, in literature. Uh, because we have to, even economically, we will we will be destroyed. Uh, I mean, now the world the world has showed us for the first time with this climate change what happens if we don't care, if we don't care about the environment, if we don't care about each other. And I deeply resent uh, eco activists who care about the sea and care about the air, but they don't care about people who are hungry and people who are ill with, while medicine can actually cure them. And so my question always in Europe is, if you have 10 breaths left, will you share it with Africa? Or will you keep it to yourself and kill us if we swim towards you? Uh, so it's, there's no survival really for anything, if you dis, if you live in disregard of others, but the, the 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 problem for me personally is how do you give, how do you share, how do you? And I have thought that South Africa would actually work it out. This is what people have to give. This is how we should give. This is how we should share. This is the sharing. But we are not. We are all scrambling to see what we can get, um, and yeah, I, it's, it's it's not. It's. I will never you, uh, like to be a what is economic? What is that? Economic something. Uh, or are you reading in the chat yeah, today? I will never be a homo economicus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll just invite uh, Professor Kia, do you still want to post your question? Um, I just want to take one yeah. last question after you. Thanks. Yeah, I, yeah. in fact, we, we're, we're running out of time. I was just trying to take a chance, you know, um, uh, because uh, I, I, the chat was a bit slow. Uh, so 
and then of course the chat pickup. So um, if it, I can pass as well, but I, I just, but I, because I saw that Babalwa actually said that Anki may, must come back perhaps for a discussion on the TRC, because I wanted to link, there was uh, this girl with a master's degree that was done on the right not to forgive, you know, and um, how that played out, but whether that can have an ethical foundation in African society, you know, the right not to forgive. Um, and I was trying to figure out, you know, how to frame that question, but I think it's gonna be way too long that response. That was the one, and the second one was whether, whether Prof. Peterson has himself thought that he read, he reread, um, you know, uh, Pleike and the Bele uh, within the context of the decolonization imperative, you know, because it seems that uh, in the in the text that you quote, that he is actually critiquing, you know, even the misreading from those who speak from a decolonization perspective. And what was his own sense of reading in that in that tone? And what would he then regard it as a decolonizing uh, rereading of that text? And that would have been that, uh, but um, I, I don't think, I, I'm not so sure I, whether you can have a short response to that. Uh, my apologies. Can I, mm, that's fine. Can I just invite U, U, U Professor van der Rees Dezen to put her question forward and then, and then uh, Anki, you can give us your concluding comments. And before I invite Siamo to, 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 to conclude for everyone. Uh, Prof. Christie, thanks. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much to, to, uh, to Anki for, you know, for a really wonderful um, talk uh, and, and a, lot, a lot to chew on for us. Um, I was just wondering about the, the idea of forgiveness. We know that uh, uh, in the last, in recent times, I, I would say the last decade or more, the whole idea of forgiveness has come under a lot of, of pressure. And um, yeah, you know, so is, is there, is, and, and you're talking about solidarities and uh, ways of finding one another, um, almost thinking the unthinkable given our history. Um, is, is forgiveness still part of that? Or was, was for, is forgiveness a spent, a spent idea? And should we try and find new words or new concepts to you know to try and link with one another and uh, you know given I, given this um, very complex situation we find ourselves in here in south africa no it's true it, and it is very unpopular to talk about forgiveness and it it's also i mean i myself have stopped talking about it because i feel it's only me who gains from it you know so i no i i don't people people don't need to forgive Anyway, so it, 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 it has changed. At the same time, I feel the fact that we are not at each other's throats is because at this stage, so many old white people are being looked after by black nurses and so many black people who are suffering or are talented are being assisted. So there's, 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 uh, there's places, and it's not in the politics, and it's not in the in the expensive areas. It's in rural areas. I find there's um, people have a feeling that they will all go under. If, if, if we don't assist one another. And it's in small things, it is. So in a way, I, th I think you don't talk about it anymore, but there's more of an acceptance of where people come from and from the injustice. I think there's a, there's a, a more responsible feeling of, I don't know, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know whether there's a place for reconciliation. I just know that if we don't learn to live with one another, we will end this world. We will end each other and we will end each and we will end this world. And the thing is, in the way in which you keep yourself separate and rich and and privileged, those awful ways 
become part of yourself so you will be you will become like shaka you will be you will eat your own flesh thank you thank you thank you so much professor groch i just want to really thank you Anybody who knows the things I study knows this was probably <laughs> going to be one of my favorite seminars for the year because I'm just steeped in black historical literatures and just trying to find that interconnected relationship with the with the silos that, and the, the way that literatures have been kept separate in South Africa, um, largely because of sort of, you know, the, the history of uh, white supremacy and this misreading of our imaginations as separate when they're so intertwined and flowing in so many ways. So thank you for this beautiful and rich presentation. I just want to invite Uziamo, who is a philosophy student. So here's a philosopher and uh, who um, introduced you at the beginning, just to give her concluding uh, uh, thank yous and, and comment, and then uh, it will be thank you from all of us. Uh, Tiamo, it's, it's, your, it's your stage. Um, thank you. So I just wanted to say before I conclude that I think African literature is so important for us to engage in, not only because of like its geographical relevance to us, but because of like, because how, of how it increases our social consciousness and tells the story, the story of the lived social, political and economic experiences of Africans by Africans. And I really like what Dr. Makotwana said, that it confirms the depth of language and how it influences the ontologies that free that free us. So I feel like it almost prompts us to continue to tell the stories because of how powerful they are. And it keeps um, the African language and heritage alive in alive and well in um, the university community. And I think that's very important. I just like to say thank you so much, Sawaki Speaker and Kikroch for engaging us in this very informative. And for me, I like um, very mind provoking conversation. Thank you to everyone in the audience for taking time to attend and thank you for all your engagements. To the Africa and Knowledge Organizing Team, the DVC, Professor Andre Keat, Professor Norma Langam Kize, Dr. Mutindan Zioki, Professor Uchenna Okeja, Dr. Jenny Dupree, and Anele Mkadi. Thank you so much for making the seminar possible. I think it's important for the community, for the university community to have these kind of spaces and conversations. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great week going forward. And yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. And uh, yeah, thank you to all the supporting and collaborating partners, Emengeni Institute for Global Dialogue, um, Center for Philosophy in Africa. Uh, there's Dr. Mutinda. Thank you so much, colleagues. And have a good afternoon. We have to then think about Babalwa's invitation. Uh, Professor Giet. Uh, uh, hi, time. Ellen. Mm, we must discuss this. There is, uh, yeah. But I suppose this is the I this is the decolonizing work that you speak of of U U Peterson finding this these interconnected genre um, imaginations in the literature. No, no, for sure. Uh, I hope Anki would be open to it. <laughs> it was very lovely for me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much for the invitation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And bye bye, Baba. Bye. Bye, <laughs> bye Anki. Good bye. to see you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, colleagues. Bye. Thanks so much, Jenny. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>